Uh, hello. We'll be beginning in about uh, four or five minutes. Oui. Oh, ouais. Merci so we'll begin in four minutes, just the time to leave a few more people to join us.
Okay, hello everyone, welcome on board. So we'll be beginning soon. My name is Martin, I'm the founder of uh, Innovation is Everywhere. Uh, you are going to know a little bit more about myself, the company I run before we, we start the webinar. So the way it's going to work is that I'm going to launch a video which is, uh, I just recorded just before. Uh, so that's me presenting in about uh, 30 minutes uh, the topic of the day, uh, how China is eating the world. And I hope you will be uh, convinced that there's a lot to do just after that. So I will launch the video during which uh, we won't be able to talk, but we can still use the chat room, which is just on the right side. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just use the chat. If you have any questions during the 30 minutes of the pre-recorded presentation, feel certainly free to push your questions in the chat box because then I can see them and uh, we can take them during the Q&A, which will be just after that. All right. So we are going now live with the video for 30 minutes and we'll have after about uh, 15, 20 minutes of uh, Q&A. All right. You enjoy everything and I'm reachable on the chat room just on your right side as well uh, all time. Okay. I see you in a while. Tschüss. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, welcome to the very first webinar of uh, Innovation is Everywhere. Today we have decided to launch this series of educational uh, webinars by addressing the topic of China is eating the world. It's a very big name and a very big ambition, but I think we will be able to make it in about uh, 25 minutes and we'll have uh, time for questions and answers just after that. I decided to put the picture of those uh, very colorful bikes on the front page because they represent very well one of the latest tech wars that you have today in China. A year ago, in May 2016, a few startups with the names of Ofo and Mobike have popped out from nowhere in China and they began to offer the service of bike sharing. The difference with the bike sharing services that we know in Europe or in the US is that you don't need a dock to take the bike from and to put it back after you ride. You can literally take a bike anywhere and leave it anywhere. It's possible through the QR code technology where you can just scan the QR code on the back of the bike and take it with you and lock it afterwards. It's also made possible with the integrated payment system on WeChat and as a result, when I went to China in November 2016, I saw a few people using those bikes and four months later, it was becoming a public order problem. Everyone was literally using those bikes and it was almost impossible to walk on the roadside or on the pavement because everyone was just leaving their bike there so that people could take them afterwards. It's a very short story, but it's quite a good one of the, the fast and the, the fast pace of adoption of technology in China. In just one year, those three companies have collectively raised more than one billion US dollar. And the technology experts think that they will be acquired by much larger ride sharing, car sharing, and taxi hailing companies, such as Didi, the equivalent of Uber in China. So again, welcome to this webinar. My name is Martin Pasquier. I'm French. I'm 33 years old. I'm living in Singapore, where I have set foot about five years ago. And the vision I had was really to crawl and to grow the countries of Asia and the emerging markets to understand the new innovations that we couldn't really see in the Silicon Valley or in the European countries. My vision is to help the clients and the companies we work with to understand those ecosystems, to anticipate the disruption that comes from Asia. And today is an excellent day that we feel uh, for the webinar because the technology that comes from Asia and in particular China is beginning to go a little bit overseas. The company I co-founded with Mathieu, my partner, is called Innovation is Everywhere. We are a team of nine consultants from all countries, staying in Singapore, Shanghai, and Paris, traveling a lot. And we have three trades to help our companies and our clients to operate the business transformation. The first trade that we do is 
exactly this one. We help them to understand innovation trends, startups, innovation, VCs, and whatever hot is happening in those very big markets such as China, India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and the likes. The second trade we have is to help them to change the way they work and to operate a mindset change of their C-level and their executives so that they can address this new field which is moving very fast and which requires new skill and a new way to work as a big company. The third pillar of our business is to uh, do new prototypes of new businesses, new services, and new products that can have an impact for these big companies in the Asia Pacific region. So here we are, and we're going to jump right now in telling you why we think China is in the world. There's actually three types of topics that we work on as a company. The first one is disruptive Asia, curating those trends sourcing the startups, meeting the VCs, meeting the big companies as well, and covering the main big tech events that are the epicenter of innovation in Asia. You may be familiar with South by Southwest or the Consumer Electronic Show in Las Vegas. Of course, there's plenty full of extremely large and innovative events and conferences in Asia, and we always go there for a few days to talk with the crowd, to talk with the innovators and get those trends right and get really uh, a sense of what is going to be hot in the next few months, in the next few years. The second type of topic we work on is what we call corporate innovation. As we told you a little bit before, we help our companies to go from learning about the new trends to changing their organization and then doing new stuff, new businesses, new business models, new pricing, new, new things that make more sense for Asia. We do a lot of connections between big companies and startups. We do due diligence for M&A. We do a lot of prototyping, of course, and we set up a different type of labs, boards, that can be helpful for the big companies to interact a bit more with the innovation. The last thing that we work on, and it's also a part of our own methodology, is the network of key connectors that we maintain and we expand over the months, over the years in Asia. It's literally impossible to Google new innovation coming from China. You have very little information, and in countries like China, India, or Bangladesh, where the language is not primarily English, you need to have people that can help you to decipher what is hot and what is not. We have about 20 to 30 key connectors in the main countries of Asia, which we can rely on, and they act for us as a source of information, as consultants, as facilitators, they usually work in co-working spaces, in VC companies, in big startups, in big companies, and that's really the, the main asset that we have today to be able to connect very fast to deep insights of countries that are very hard to Google or to know of from just an online uh, interaction. And we meet and interview a lot of experts, a lot of people that are amazing all over the week so that we get more of this information. I think I've said about, about enough about ourselves, so we are not going to dive into the hot topic of why China is in the world. I think we can begin very simply by taking the two visions that we think people still have of China and the West. Most people still think that China is a huge factory with a lot of workers that produce a, a wealth of cheap, affordable goods that are flowing into the Western markets and in the emerging markets. It's partly true, but it's changing very fast. When it comes to innovation, people think that China is the land of copycats, the land of counterfeiting, a land where you just take any idea that works in the country and you make it faster, cheaper, and better. Again, I don't say it was not true, but it's changing very fast and today the trend is a little bit of the reverse. Similarly, the feeling we have is that many people consider the West as a land of democracy, of parliamentary uh, regimes with a lot of middle class that consume a lot of products and also a very big focus on the Silicon Valley and the GAFA, the Google, the Amazon, the Apple and the Facebook uh, as the center of innovation that really uh, rule the new innovation in the world. Again, it's a little bit of a cliche which we assume as innovation is everywhere, but when we talk to different people, especially uh, in Europe or in the US, we can feel that those visions are still very strong. The problem is today that in Western countries, 
the leadership has been failing for the last two to three years. I don't need to name those two fellows on the upper picture of the slide, but obviously the journey that they take their countries on is not really the one that will be very helpful for their population on the long term. On the short term, maybe, but the wings of globalization being the ones they are, the way those two countries are getting more in war looking, more protective, is probably not the right answer to whatever is happening today in the world and in Asia. In terms of statistics, we also know that the Western countries have probably reached the end of a very wealthy cycle, and we see now a rising uh, inequality happening in many of these countries with a shrinking middle class and what we call shrinking opportunities. Many people of my generation, and that's also why I'm in Asia and not in Europe, feel that they're not going to make as much or better than their parents. This feeling is very widespread and of course fuels the rise of nationalism, protectionism in all the old Europe and uh, US uh, countries today. Of course, Asia is not uh, totally blind and uh, deaf to those signals, and they also feel that it's the right time to expose the leadership, and in particular from China. You may have heard that the President Xi Jinping from China has been the only and most vocal defensor of globalization and against the protectionism at the last World Economic Forum in Davos. Similarly, Jack Ma, the very charismatic founder of Alibaba, which is today one of the largest tech companies in China and the world, is also assuming that China is going to grow its own values, its own wisdom, and is on the right path when he looks at the global balance of the world today. He recently said in an interview to SNBC, CNBC, sorry, that he wanted Alibaba, his company, to be literally the fifth country in the world. The ambition of the leadership of China today is a global vision, a global ambition. And of course, it has a very solid statistic basis. If you take a look at the chart at the bottom of the slide, it shows you the growth of the middle class in China. And more, uh, more interestingly and more amazingly, if you take a look at the projection for 2022, in just five years time, 75% of the urban population of China, people living in cities, will be either affluent, be very wealthy, or from the upper middle class. I'm not sure which class you are in, but there's no country on earth today where you have 75% of people who are upper middle class or affluent. It will generate a lot of new demands for new services, new businesses, new products that we don't know yet of today. It's very important to understand that on one side, the West is reaching an end, and on the other side, Asia and China, as its unique uh, power, is really going overseas and has a lot of work which is been bigger for the last few years and which is going faster and faster. We're not going to dive into a series of uh, vertical histories where we feel that China is hitting the world. And the first one, which is maybe the most famous, is e commerce and O2O, which stands for online to offline. If you just take a quick look at the statistics, the size of the e-commerce and mobile commerce markets in China is just tremendous to me. Yes, the country of China is big as well, but not all of the 1.2 billion Chinese citizens are today able to do mobile commerce. There's probably at least 50% more potential in that country in what we call the second, the third, and the fourth higher cities. Cities which are below 5 million, below 1 million people, and there are a lot of them in China, which are still onboarding on the process of mobile payments and mobile commerce. It's really very neat. The startup that we have decided to select for this slide is the one that you can see on the bottom of the slide. It's called Dmall. So don't mix up with Tmall, which is the, the giant anti-commerce platform from Alibaba. Dmall has been founded two years ago by a former executive director of the Chinese telecom company Huawei. And he has raised, visited, $100 billion in seed funding. It's a huge amount of money. And the value proposition that he has is to transform any retail outlet, any supermarket, any small shop, any convenience store, which is two kilometers around your phone at the moment of the purchase, 
into a gigantic warehouse. Let's say you are a Chinese father, you come back from work after a long day of work in a very jam and congested city. If you want to do your grocery, you don't want to lose one hour to go to the supermarket, to the convenience store, and maybe to the specialty market. This app will help you to buy anything which is in any store two kilometers around you, and it will take care of a single payment and a single delivery under one hour. The level of convenience which is brought by this online to offline uh, startup is just tremendous, and it's a huge trend in China. A lot of innovation come from the fact that we need to give more convenience to people there. Another vertical where we feel that China has a lot of uh, advance is when it comes to online content and monetization. If you use Facebook and Google like me, you know that the business model of these two companies is not very original. It's about advertising and selling your data to advertisers. For Google, more than 90% of their huge size of revenues come only from advertising. In China, most of the big social media platforms are actually generating their monetization strategy from services, not advertising. What you can see on the left of the slide here is a, a new trend in China called live streaming. Live streaming is not only used by half of the Chinese mobile users today, they also tip the streamers, they give content, they give a gift to the people that stream the content. And you can see on the picture just here that this lady has been uh, granted a gift of this uh, car, in a way, which is worth $45 that you can buy as a user. And so she will take 30% of the value of this gift in pocket money. And today, in China, the market of these live streaming gifts, if you want, is almost as big as the market of the movie cinema and the box office in China. It's $5 billion today. The movie... Uh, the movie box office market in China is 7 billion. It's very close. And people are very used to gifting relevant streamers, a relevant content provider with money. On the right side, you can see something which is a little bit more classical, but still very interesting. It's an app called uh, The Dao, and they have 7 million users. And they actually offer users to pay for curated channels of content. You know today, if you are a Western user, you get a lot of content for free, but a lot of this is also advertising. And you also have to suffer a lot of pop-ups and advertising from all around the browser. Here, the value proposition is the one that you are going to follow and to pay a yearly subscription to a key opinion leader that you think is a good curator for the type of news that you look for. So for $30 per year on average, you will subscribe to a channel in the same way that you subscribe today to a newspaper or a TV channel by paying for it in the Western countries. It's, of course, much more agile, and it's uh, for any type of content, from tutorials to luxury to lifestyle to, uh, you know, English uh, format and everything. It's a great big trend. One of the best known uh, technology advances in China is on the mobile payments. I don't know how many times you have paid on a mobile a few things, but it's probably not a lot. In China, you have one major app, which is called WeChat. Think of a mix of Facebook, Grab, Uber, Dating, everything is in one app. And uh, WeChat opened its final platforms a few years ago, so you could just link your bank card and your bank account to the app. And what you can see on the left is actually the, the number of payments that you can do. So you can do a quick pay. A quick pay is the picture that you can see on the right. It's when you just scan a QR code with your WeChat application, and it will generate a bill, which you can pay directly with the phone. It's a hugely popular way of payment today in uh, retail outlets in uh, China. And when I went to uh, Shanghai a few weeks ago, I began to feel a little bit uncomfortable because some shops and some restaurants, they don't accept cash anymore. They tell you that, you know, you should have the mobile payment version like anyone. You can also transfer money from person to person. You can top up your mobile phone uh, credit plan. You can pay for the electricity bill. You can pay for the movie tickets, you can pay for your taxi ride, you can invest your money in uh, unit trust and investment options. 
You can do a lot of things, uh, pretty much every payment that you can face in China, you can today do it in uh, WeChat payments. And that's why you can see the statistics on the bottom right of the slide, that's the amount of mobile payments that were made two years ago in 2015 in the US and China. You cannot see the US because it's only $8 billion mobile payments two years ago, when it was already $1,500 billion in China, 1.5 trillion. It was two years ago. So I let you imagine the, that the gap has, of course, widened over the last two years. Another topic where China is getting very, very fast at the top level is artificial intelligence, one of the main technology that is going to reshuffle our world in the next 10 to 30 years. They are getting more and more patent application, and even more worryingly for the Western researchers, more and more of the patents on AI from Chinese companies and Chinese research centers are in Chinese. So it means we, we can't access that much the type of knowledge that they are producing. I'm just going to show you two startups which you can see on the right side of the, of the slide. The first one is called iCarbonX. It's a startup from China that has got about half a billion dollars in funding, and their job is to gather all types of healthcare data to give you better day-to-day -day health recommendation for your long-term lifestyle and, of course, improved lifestyle. The one you can see at the bottom is called iFlyTech. It's one of the leaders today globally in text and speech recognition. Many experts assess that they do a better job than the US companies on that uh, voice assistance and uh, it's like the Siri for China, but it works way better. And today they are valued at uh, $6 billion. So artificial intelligence, it's an enormous uh, upheaval for the industries worldwide. And increasingly, the biggest innovations are going to come from China. Another field which is more in the infrastructure is about renewable energy. So of course, you know today if you go to China, the conditions of pollution and uh, environmental damage are very big. Uh, one month ago when I went to Beijing, it was very sunny and very fresh and I could have my jogging there. And just two days after that, they had one of these sm smog explosions with you know, very dark scenes, you couldn't see the next building over the streets, and it was of course very dangerous for anyone breathing in over there. But the reality also in terms of investment is that China today is investing much more than the European Union on the renewable energy, and they have about $780 billion plan of investment in 2030. In China, this kind of planification of investment is usually uh, turning into reality, so there's a good chance that they're going to turn around their own model and become the leading power in clean tech and renewable energy. The two pictures you can see on the right are the, la the largest uh, floating photovoltaic plant, which opened in the Wenang region just last week. And at the bottom, you can see the largest solar field in the world, in the Longchang Dam. And it's about $1 billion investment that can power up to 200,000 households in that region of China. It's getting very big, and the more news you are going to see are very impressive. My personal bet, if you want to invest, is that you should really buy a house or a flat in a very polluted Chinese city, northeast of China, because my guess and my bet is that in 30 years, it will probably be a very clean area. It goes extremely fast. Robotics and automation is a very interesting trend in China as well. Today, China faces two big issues in terms of demographics. The population is aging very fast, and the, the millennials, the new uh, generation of students, they don't want to work in factories and in repetitive jobs. So they know that to maintain their industrial power, China will need to robotize a lot of their industries. And they are, and have already taken uh, a certain lead on that. Uh, there are about 800 Chinese robot makers today, and they want to dominate the global industries for driverless, driverless vehicles and home appliances. The three startups that you can take a look at will be uh, eDeodar. So they produce very high level industrial robots for just 30% of the price of uh, the same quality in Germany or in the US. 
The second one is JD.com. So JD.com is the second largest e-commerce platform in China. It's very big. And they really want to get rid of any human work in the warehouses and in the delivery. So they are automating a lot of the process uh, so that they really rely on very few highly qualified workers. And the third one is uh, Midea, who has bought over with a little bit of controversy uh, one of the largest uh, industrial robots makers of Germany for four billion dollars. So the goal of China here is to be the number one industrial robot provider in the world. Today they are still lagging behind Korea, Germany, and the US, but it will not last. And they also want in their own country to increase the robotization level to 90% of all the workforce. It's huge, but again, the markets in China and the demographic trends are, are a big push for them to automate uh, as much as they can. So we're almost getting to the end of these uh, few slides. Uh, I just want to put a little bit of perspective in terms of uh, global vision. You may have heard about this uh, global ambition of the new Chinese president, uh, Xi Jinping. He said that he wants to rebuild the Silk Road, which was a very successful trade route between China, Europe, and the Middle East uh, a few centuries ago. He has put about one trillion dollar investment to build the infrastructure, the railways, the airports, the deep sea ports, so that the goods from China can flow more naturally to European markets and the Middle East and South Asia. If you follow this initiative, you will see that the investments are tremendous. And just a few weeks ago, the very first train went non-stop from London to China on just one track. And if I remember well, they did the trip in 15 days, one file, which is half the time which is required by a boat transport. So of course, you have less material on the train than on the boat, but it's going to change the face of global logistics. And of course, it's going to put China even more closer to the markets of uh, Europe and the Middle East. What's interesting with the global ambition of China is that their own tech giants are going to be on the front line of this uh, global expansion. On this infographics, uh, we try to understand how many unicorns, so a unicorn is a $1, one billion dollar valuated technology company in the world, at any point of time, you have about 150 to 200 uh, unicorns, companies like Uber, like Airbnb. In China, you have about 35 of them, and they are expanding notably overseas. Two years ago, they were still focusing on the Chinese market, which is very big. Today, they go overseas. So I just give you a few examples on the right side, but WeChat, for example, they have decided to open the WeChat payments to Chinese tourists overseas in Europe. By doing so, they are literally taking over the transaction fees and the payment system for $300 billion of spending amount of the Chinese tourists in Europe. It's a huge amount. It's the equivalent of the European e-commerce market on one year. And just by opening this feature, they get back that money and they get back the transaction share of all the amount of spending which is made by Chinese tourists overseas. Tencent, so Tencent is the second largest tech company in China. They are the owners and publishers of WeChat, among others. They have bought the leading healthcare company in India and they are also making big strides. They have bought 5% of Tesla, the autonomous and electrical vehicle from the US that I guess you know very recently. So, Again, the switch that I was talking on in the first few slides is really happening now. Whatever was kept a little bit secretly in China the last five to 10 years is expanding bit by bit. And as you can see, they have the scale and they have the money to buy everything around. In Southeast Asia, in Singapore, closer to where I live now, they have decided, Alibaba in particular, to take over the e-commerce and the logistics markets. Today, they pretty much control the e-commerce market of Southeast Asia, and Southeast Asia is a 600 million population region with very fast growth, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, Myanmar. Today, if you were an e-commerce company, I would tell you that it's already too late to come to Southeast Asia. Alibaba is there, and they have both the logistics and the many e-commerce players. Job is done. 
What can you do? It's a bit of uh, amazing or boring picture that we give you, but we are definitely convinced that China is on track to be the leading power globally. And in the same way that today you use the Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft services, we are certain that in the next 10 to 20 years, we will use the Chinese services at the same scale. What can you do? The first thing is to travel to China. Go there once a year, pick any city, go again and see the pace of change and the, the level of wealth and the level of innovation that is driving this country. It's truly amazing. You can also join the learning expeditions that we do regularly for our clients. We go a few times in the year to Shenzhen, to Shanghai, to Beijing, to the main cities, just to show what are the best innovations, the best VCs, and the best things that you can get inspiration from. And of course, you can follow the events that we cover and the news that we share on our website. We have your email and we will uh, send you regularly some updates, uh, no advertising, just the, the kind of uh, essence that we uh, get from China when we go there. A second thing to do is to anticipate at home. Chinese tourists and China companies are going to come in every country in the world. So as a business, you should get prepared to meet with people from Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, and many other companies. And you should ensure that your business is Chinese tourist proof. It's the very first step that you should do. Do you have a payment system that Chinese people can use? Is your website in Chinese? Do you have a hotline or a customer service that can speak Chinese? It's very important. The number of tourists from China is going to grow tremendously. The level of spending that they do is always very, very big. So if you want a part of that cake, you need to ensure that you can post and have an interaction with them. And of course, you can try to be the copycat of China yourself. Copycat, you know, a few years ago, uh, many people were saying that Chinese would only copy innovation from the West. Today, a company like Facebook is openly trying to understand how WeChat got so smart to onboard so many people in online payments. I don't know if you remember, but Facebook has been born in 2006, and they have been trying for the last eight years to implement a payment system in Facebook and in Messenger. I don't think that you ever paid anything to Facebook, even though all of your friends and all of your brands are there. WeChat has solved this problem, and today they are the leading company in mobile payments. So take inspiration from the Chinese markets. They are very user-centric. They really are for mass markets, and it's a big source of inspiration for you guys. So we are coming to an end in 30 minutes uh, exactly, which is not too bad in terms of time management. The next webinar that we will do will be on uh, Friday 7th of July, uh, Singapore time and French time, we'll do two of them in English et en français. It will be about smart cities in Asia. Smart cities is a very sexy topic as well. You know that Asia is a very populated region of the world, 4 million people. I think on the top 10 cities, six of them are in Asia. Beijing, Shanghai, Jakarta, Mumbai, uh, and there's a lot of uh, challenges to address from pollution, to traffic, to safety, to energy, to innovation. We will have a, a quick tour of the best smart cities in Asia and what kind of innovation we can take from there. Thanks a lot. This is the end of the presentation and I will meet you guys in just one second for the question and answer session. Thanks a lot, it was Martin, Innovations Everywhere, for the first webinar of China in the World. Thank you and see you soon. Bye bye. I think you should be okay. You should be able to see me again and hear me again. So, thanks for your attention and your uh, many questions and pointers, in particular Max. <laughs> a lot of very good insights. I do agree that uh, the title of the presentation and uh, the the way I wanted to show it is a bit provocative. Uh, that was, I think, for, first you know we are we are in the region for the last uh, five six years and working with Western companies in particular we see a lot of uh, signals, weak signals and trends that pop up in the different countries and which we show to them, we expose them to the, the founders, the VCs and everything. 
And even over the course of the last two years, for some of these signals and meetings that we have uh, made happen for our clients, they really didn't understand and didn't see. And short short time after, they really understand that uh, they were not open enough to understand uh, what the trend was in playing. So for messaging apps and payments, uh, it's very clear. We had one client in uh, payments from Europe, pretty big one, and they, they told us all the time, but uh, WeChat will never be in Europe. Uh, they don't have the licenses. They don't have the legal framework. And I said, yeah, they might not have it, but uh, they are probably going to open something. And now that they open that uh, possibility for Chinese tourists to make the payments overseas and in Europe, it's going probably to be a huge loss for them because they are totally unprepared. And uh, they are going to see a lot of their own merchants to process transactions for Chinese tourists through WeChat, which they, which my client at the time almost refused to, to set up. So again, our job is really to be in the detection of those trends. We see a lot happening in India on biometry, on uh, identity management, in Southeast Asia, a little bit on e-commerce, but innovation is less, uh, I would say, uh, less world changing and game changing that we can see from uh, China and India. So we regularly share those kind of updates uh, with them. And for the one that uh, are really most advanced, they are already prototyping on these trends and these ideas, either for the Chinese markets or for overseas with that kind of like uh, Chinese innovation in the background. I think also uh, that for those kind of uh, trends reports, it's also a way to balance the view that our clients, usually Fortune 500, have of innovation because most of them have been maybe to the Silicon Valley, sometimes to Israel, but it's less common, and almost none of them have come to China. So again, when we find people like uh, Max Henry, I think we find also a good challenge here. You have been there for quite a while from what I see, and I totally get your points, and I will also update the slides uh, accordingly. I think we also want to create a wake-up call for the companies we work with and that we see coming sometimes in those markets. And they are, they are amazed by anything because more or less no one told them and they just get a little bit of the surface knowledge when once in a while they have on Wired or on TechCrunch or on Harvard Business Review one article that tells them a little bit more. But we feel that the, the type of information they get from uh, online sources are still very feeble and uh, show a very, very small part of the story. And again, we are also very convinced that the, the pace of innovation in these countries and China in particular is too fast. So it means if they miss one trend, they are really going to take a huge hit if ever those trends can uh, be applied in, uh, in other countries. Do you guys have any other question? Shalom, I will send you a bit more information about Dimol. I think we have written an article about it uh, two years ago when we met the, the founder uh, in Beijing. So I will send you the link. And uh, they have a website full in Chinese, but I can send you the link as well. Welcome. Interaction between Chinese startups and the ones overseas. Yes, definitely. I think they, they lack connections, but they are going to they are going progressively, I think, to tie up. So for example, if you take WeChat, they have opened this uh, kind of accelerator in South Africa. I think they're really trying to find their grounds. Uh, I think they know that they come from a world, China, which is a planet of its own. So it's not easy for them to just connect and interact there. But for example, I've been talking with one of the big travel brands in uh, Europe and uh, they wanted to come to China for a learning expeditions about new trends. And they were telling me that uh, for the last few months, uh, they are being marketed quite aggressively by the Paris office of Alibaba and Tencent. I didn't know they had someone there, but apparently they have someone there now. So they're also trying to push a little bit uh, in terms of uh, having a head office there. So that's the tech giants, not yet the startups. But again, my feeling is that the Chinese market is also going to reach a certain level of saturation soon. And uh, 
Chinese people are quite literally hungry for business in the region and overseas. So I really see it coming again. Uh, it's like, you know, a few dots on the way of, uh, of a global domination and we're not yet there. But if you compare again uh, the, the pace of innovation and the type of uh, moves that uh, the Google, Apple, Facebook or Amazon have been doing recently, except Amazon, the other ones are not that amazingly uh, moving things that fast and uh, in so many directions. So it's really something to, to keep in mind. Southeast Asia is very exciting. Uh, it looks a little bit like Europe in a way. A lot of countries, some of them big, some of them small. You have kind of like a similar Asian, Southeast Asian culture, but still a lot of differences in language, religions, etc. Uh, but for those countries in Southeast Asia, it's also quite hard to scale across the markets. Uh, I think Grab, the, the, the cab, cab hailing uh, and cab sharing app has been one of the successful ones. But we still lack a, a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, regional leaders that can take over the rest. Uh, if you take the real estate market, if you take e-commerce, there's still not a clear uh, big two or three guys who are competing at the regional level in Southeast Asia. It's mostly country by country. There's a lot of um, infrastructure issue. Culturally, it's very different as well. But uh, I do agree that uh, Southeast Asia, India are very, very exciting now. Competitors to demo, uh, honestly, Shalom, there's a lot of uh, competition in that O2O space. Uh, you have all the delivery companies uh, like uh, LA.com and everything. So uh, yeah, I will send you a list. Max Henry, well noted. We will do one in Southeast Asia. There, again, for, for us, the idea was also to start with something a little bit bigger than Southeast Asia, which is probably a little bit more confidential if you address uh, a Western audience of uh, the companies we usually work with, like Fortune 500. But uh, we, will do, uh, we will do something on Southeast Asia. We will probably try to find a good angle. It can be on uh, the social media or the mobile commerce, which are quite big things there. Uh, yeah, so I do know that. And yeah, Dimol, Dimol has like hundreds of competitors. I mean. Any company that works a lot in uh, China has <laughs> at least 100 competitors. So that's always uh, always pretty big. Cool. So I, I will be here and I will prepare uh, even better for your questions then. <laughs> OK, guys, so we'll wrap up this first session. Uh, thanks a lot for attending and for uh, being the guinea pigs. It's the first webinar we do. Uh, so I know the audio was a little bit uh, not good. So next time, I think I will do it with the mic so that we have a little bit of a better, uh, better audio quality. Uh, so next session is Friday, July 7th on uh, Smart Cities. And then maybe for August, we'll do something on Southeast Asia. So thanks again. We'll send you the slides. And we'll send you also a small uh, poll so that you can assess uh, the webinar and what you like, what you didn't like to make it better. And uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much and have a great evening, day or morning, wherever you are. Bye-bye, guys.